And we are live. Hello, everyone. We have a, uh, a, a special uh, sorry about that. Special podcast going on. I have uh, two of my good friends, Jared Farmer and Raymond, whose last name I still can't pronounce. Carrier. 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 Something French. Pierre. <laughs> Raymond something French. Something French. So we're going to be talking about um, a, a general idea, uh, this distinction between that happens really in starts in post-modernity, raises this big question of truth. Uh, this has come up a lot early 21st century, this question, this phrase that you've heard being passed around maybe. Sometimes in political discourse, it kind of got its origin in philosophy that we live in a post-truth society, so we're going to talk about this distinction between the modern kind of understanding of truth, very broadly speaking, and then the more postmodern understanding of post-truth. So, Jared Raymond, start off by introducing yourselves, and then we'll get started and jump into it. Sure, I'll start, yeah. Uh, Raymond, obviously. Uh, PhD in religion, Claremont Graduate University. Um, full disclosure, I'm currently working as an instructional content developer, so I'm, I'm not teaching right now. So um, I'm going to listen and contribute in You're terms of thought. Mostly. Yeah. It's mostly you. <laughs> mostly me. I, I, and, and we can start with just a simple question. I'd be very curious to know um, a very simple question. Is there such thing as post-truth or is it just um, like a buzzword? of people who haven't deeply considered what it what it you know really means so that would be my first question my answer to that is i don't i don't think there is such thing as a post-truth uh world but we'll, we'll hash that out jared would you introduce yourself uh thomas jared farmer i am currently completing my dissertation i'm in the final stages of my dissertation <laughs> The University of University of Münster in Münster, Germany. Uh, I have two master's degrees: one in religion, one in philosophy, from Claremont Graduate University, in Claremont, California. Two other master's degrees, uh, <laughs> both from Emory University, one both in theology. Um, yeah, is that it? Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, that's all you want me to say. Okay. Yeah, we need like a like a a ticker at the bottom, right? Which says who we are. So we don't have to do this every time. <laughs> well, it says who I am, but uh, we're all on the same screen. So uh, a lot of false modesty by both uh, Jared and Raymond. Raymond's the only actual doctor here thus far. So uh, don't let him <laughs> fool you there. So let's start off. Uh, Raymond, what was, rephrase what you said about post-truth. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is, is it a real thing or is it just, like a buzzword. I, I personally feel like, and, and, and you can, you know, change my mind. I'm fine with that. Um, I think it is the remnants of lazy reasoning an overabundance of information due to uh, the internet and the accessibility of potential knowledge, not necessarily knowledge, right? Like there's a criteria for what you could literally, legitimately call knowledge my thing is is that if there's a post-truth um there's just there's no post-truth there has to be there's truth not a capital t i won't say that but like a little t at least there are just certain things that you practically you have to accept as being truthful well i think that it's a bit of a branding problem but i think that you've you've pointed out what the purpose of post-truth is. So I think that we should separate the discourses, right? So you have post-truth in the way in which it's been referred to in political discourse. And then you have post-truth in the way in which it's been discussed by say postmodern thinkers uh, in philosophical discourse. And I think those are two different things. Absolutely. So in post -tr post-truth in political discourse is a buzzword and it relates basically to, um, 
issues which are, did not originate with Donald Trump, but which have defined the the Trump era, as it were. So let's put that to post fact. Yeah, let's mm-hmm. put that to the side for just a moment, and let's talk about it in philosophical alternative terms. facts. Yeah, right? alternative yeah. facts. We'll have to get to those. Both of those. fake news. Yeah, yeah, fake news. Actually. So I think that's that's one thing that we can set aside for just a moment. Let's let, let's talk about specifically with regards to philosophy. So when philosophers talk about post-truth, they are speaking about what you mentioned. There is no capital T truth. There's no big truth, which is just out there apart from the human observer, the human interpreter. Instead, truth is always situational and is always related to a subject. So maybe there's, you know, a world out there that's we're not talking about like forms of idealism right or radical skepticism radical skepticism instead we're talking about kind of a, fun, a phenomenological hermeneutical approach to understanding the world so when we talk about truth truth is always context specific and it's always theory laden uh, so when we say x is truth we mean specific things with regards to that um and because we recognize that truth is situational in these regards there is no capital t truth just outside of any and all observers and any and all context which is true forever and always regardless of observation so that recognition itself is post truth post capital t -T truth it's a more nuanced uh, hermeneutical and frankly philosophical approach to understanding truth which breaks with kind of the metaphysical tradition um which is usually tacked on to Plato for various reasons, but yeah, you, you want to yeah. contribute anything to that? Can I also yeah. just yeah. let me let me ta- yeah. just one thing? So I was talking, right? I'm sorry, <laughs> but you're hosting, so it's so much better. <laughs> it's so much better when we're all in the same room. This is a rare occasion. Yeah, we haven't is. we haven't ever. You guys have been together, right? I've right. never Us been here, so. All right, you say what you're going to say. I just I wanted to say, just for so. clarification, that I'm thinking in very, like, as Jared says, very specific philosophical terms. I think generally post-truth is an, indicates or, or suggests that the, the wider public belief about certain things is that there is no objective truth and that we get into, like, alternative facts. So I just want to clarify that that it is... I think more about things that influence or shape public opinion versus like actual forms of truth. But um, still, uh, post truth in the sense that people are recognizing a phenomenon where uh, the wider public uh, is is less concerned about objectivity. I don't think that that's necessarily true, though. I think that that's what post truth is supposed to like point to. I think it's just people are just overwhelmed and ill-equipped to sift through the bullshit. Yeah. So building off what Jared was saying and a little bit with what Raymond was saying in my specific area, which is the history of philosophy of science, what we mean by post-truth is starting in the early to mid 20th century, there was a shift in the study and explanation of science. It starts in the French tradition with uh, historians like Alexander Coré, and then it comes over to the Americas with philosophers, historians like uh, Thomas Kuhn. And both of these thinkers, when we say post-truth, to Jared's point, what we're talking about is a uh, complex complexification, if that's the word, <laughs> making a more complex understanding of it's our understanding of science. So, you know. <laughs> make stuff up. And so with this comes the idea that, uh, yeah, especially in the 18th century, there's a very high view of science that science is just relaying our understanding of the physical world. Well, what philosophers like Coré, I can't say his last name, and Kuhn pointed out is that science is situated historically, politically, and philosophically to a certain extent. In the same ways that other disciplines are situated, uh, like philosophy. Um, That's to say that uh, science can make metaphysical assumptions in the same way that philosophy can make metaphysical assumptions, or that uh, a a particular scientist's historical situation can inform their science 
in the same way that our political uh, situation can inform our view of politics. To say that there's more to even a discipline like scientific understanding than just observations about the world. Straight observations. About well, you can, it didn't just start with Kuhn either. So if you, if you think about something like the, what's commonly referred to as the Quine do him yeah. hypothesis. So it basically is this argument that all scientific theories are un, are underdetermined. And what that basically means is, uh, again, you can speak more to this in detail. So let me just set you up with this so you, you can elaborate. So um, if you go back and you look at, say, logical positivism at the beginning of the 20th century, the chief principle in terms of uh, its relationship to science was the notion of verification. So the truth should be verifiable. Mm -hmm. And for reasons that we don't have time to get into, that kind of petered out. And it was replaced by Karl Popper's notions of um uh, disconfirmability. Uh, so not Falsified falsification one. instead of verification. Yeah. So that uh, a good theory is one which can withstand falsification. So you can compare this like uh, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is a strong theory because it has withstood, you know, more than a century of, a, of good faith attempts to discredit it. Same thing with you know, the theory, general theory of relativity is it makes predictions which would seem to contravene commonsensical notions of what you would expect, yet it provides accurate predictions of what will be uh, observable data. So Popper thought that you could falsify a theory by having rival um, observations. And what Quine Duhem basically says is any sort of, of uh, information can be explained within a wider paradigm. So this is what's picked up by Kuhn as well, is the notion that what is important is not so much individual beliefs or individual data points, but rather the interpretive framework in which they're situated. And you can move these kind of pieces around as long as they're situated within a specific frame. And so that science doesn't progress in a linear fashion towards getting uh, incrementally closer and closer to the truth. Instead, what happens is you have a paradigm, a framework for interpreting and understanding all of these data points and they reach a critical mass. And if there uh, is a better interpretive framework in terms of being able to explain in a more elegant um, and economical fashion, all of these data points, then you have a paradigm shift. And so what Kuhn says is what we're, you know, referring to the, the famous example from um, Wittgenstein's uh, philosophical investigations. When you have a paradigm shift, you have the movement from what was previously ducks to now being seen as rabbits. <laughs> Gestalt shift. Yeah. A gestalt shift. And what has not changed is the image, the data, but how you see it. Yeah, and to be fair to Kuhn, who is dead, so I guess it doesn't really matter for fair to him. But uh, shout out to Thomas Kuhn. And it, <laughs> RIP. RIP. Um, he, he does later uh, kind of walk that back a little bit, but uh, that's super boring, and we don't have to get into that. So um, quick question for the both of you, just if we can give like a short and sweet definition. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between truth and post-truth? And then we can circle back to what we were just talking about. Ray, start us off. Well, so I think it, um, I, I'll take it from a perspective of, you know, just a non-expert in the field of philosophy. I think that there was a time when there was a baseline belief in, things being truthful or being able to find truth post truth, right? Like to be able to define truth and like believe in things, right. To have faith that something that you thought was true was legitimately true. Right. Um, post truth being those sort of the, the lack of reliability on objectivity, the, uh, tendency for people to only believe things that confirm their personal convictions. Motivated reasoning. Yeah. 
and um, it, it's it's yeah. I mean, I think that I'll, I'll leave it at kind of that, and then in that term. So there's just like, and and there's there's issues wrapped in with that because from that perspective, we're talking about uh, some balance between people who are willing to just trust in authority. I think the reason that we have a question about post-truth or what I would argue is really uh, more genuinely alternative facts, you know, confirmation bias, you believe what confirms what you already believe is people were on the one hand um, jaded by expertise and authority that ended up being non-credible uh, because of the way society has been uh, overwhelmingly pushing back on beliefs through celebrity think and you know like you have doctors on tv who are telling you things that end up being inaccurate or wrong like your expertise comes from different places uh because of technology as opposed to like your localized expertise that you have a little bit more faith in so but then on the other side of that it's just it's just a yeah it's just a general um in terms of post truth just a general jaded perspective on um objectivity alternative facts i mean that's it's all about interpretation at that point it's, it's ironically it's very confirming of postmodernism mm -hmm. um i i i think that postmodernism got that wrong to some extent in terms of like truth being something primarily constructed through narrative or perspectival i mean there's definitely that's definitely true in the world uh, and the way that objectivity got reinterpreted, right? Objectivity used to mean uh, not just not verifiable per se, but just the ability to have a common or consensus amongst a community of individuals that experienced a seminal, similar phenomenon, right? Like that would be a very basic definition of objectivity. And I think that um, uh, now everything is so hyper interpretive. Uh, for better and for worse. And it's just, it's sort of growing pains. I think there's an evolution coming in terms of how we think of truth, but I don't think post-truth will stand. I think it will be a passage to something else. I don't know if that makes sense, but. I think post-modernity gets a bad rap personally, but that's they just do, me. They do get a bad rap. Well, the thing that's is. because they propose problems and they don't provide solutions. Well, there's not, what solution? Okay. <laughs> the, all right. I'll, I'll well, the fire. thing I'll is. I'll <laughs> so the, it's not just people have in mind like the pages of Le Mans Dip uh, Diplomatique or something in terms of like French intellectuals. It's a stereotype, right? You can go to analytic philosophy. You know, I remember um, years ago when I was a student in Illinois reading analytic philosophy um, and you have like Amartya Sen writing about positional objectivity. And all he means is essentially the same thing that postmodern is doing. Maybe he's writing it in more straightforward language. But he's basically making the same claim, which is like, you know, there's this historical snobbery about people in antiquity saying, well, look at these silly people who believe these silly things. But he was saying, if you look at what they're saying, they were being just as objective as anything that's happening in science today. It's just a position relative to experience and a wealth of knowledge. So they were no less intelligent. They were no less capable. They were no less objective. It's just a matter of we have a lot more data than they had. And if they had had it and they had had similar frames of reference and understanding the world, they would there would be no difference in how they see the world from how we see it. And this was a point that Kuhn made. Right. So if you look at if you compare like Newtonian physics, right, it's no less objective. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go back and look at any of these old scientific paradigms, they can account for a considerable amount of information, right? It's just that for various reasons, we interpret the world the way that we interpret it. Um, and I think that there is a, there's a characterization, uh, a caricature rather of postmodern post-truth thinking, which comes less from, you know, directly from these thinkers than it does from people talking about these thinkers, right? and what these thinkers say. If you actually go back and you read, so like Vadimo in particular, like Gian, the contemporary Italian philosopher uh, Gianni Vadimo talks about consensus building in terms of what is truth. Truth is not 
this abstract objective thing outside of all interpreters. Instead, truth is the consensus that we build in collaboration. Um, it's the same thing with um, uh, Jürgen Habermas has a similar conception of truth, right? Mm -hmm. And it can, it gets dismissed a lot, but if you look at that process, they're talking about it in hermeneutical terms, but in the real world, if you, whether you're talking about history or talking about science, how do we arrive at truth? We arrive at truth once a specific body says, builds a consensus about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, but there, but, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll touch back. It, it's, it's more than consensus building. There is an intuition within human experience that is shared, right? Like positional. Yes. I used to use a, I used to use an example or, or, you know, with my students that say you're on a sidewalk and you witness a car having an accident, right? But then somebody else on the other side of the street, right? You get, there's witness testimony. Police are trying to figure out what happened. And this other person witnesses something different, but it turns out that they only saw part of the accident because there's like a tree in their way, right? So they hear it, they see certain things, they, they assume certain things, but they didn't see the whole thing unfold because when it happened, their you know perspective was clouded by a tree in front of them. Very common, very simple thing to, to imagine, right? But at the same time, like, it's not, and, and, you know, we'll forget the Greek philosopher that we couldn't remember earlier. It's not very common for somebody to say, I'll jump off of this cliff because I know I can fly. You may not be able to know what gravity or call, you may not call it gravity in ancient times, but you knew that it had, that there was an effect of the action, right? Similar to modern times. Like you don't need to even know that it's called gravity. You don't need to know the calculation for gravity, but you know, if you're on a mountain and you jump off, you're probably going to die or at least get seriously hurt, right? So there's an, a level of intuition, that shared experience of just being human. We see things, we smell things, we feel things. They're not exact, you know, un, you know, uh, reflections of everybody's experience. There are people who are blind or who, who are deaf or who have a skewed sense of self because they got COVID, right? Like yeah. things change, but for the most part, there is some sort of general pool of experience that we can all pull from. And that is separate from saying, you know, like uh, there's a pizza parlor in New York where they're doing, you know, predatory practices against children. Just had to go there. <laughs> again, did. again, though, that's the alternative facts. Let's see, that's that the really shift. That's the shift to those two. Let me respond. Let me respond real quick, real quick. Because I think this is part of the problem that I've noticed. And this is part of the problem when I still have conversations with people when they use terms like objectivity, not to sound like a stereotypical philosopher, but oftentimes what's happening is people are op people are operating on two different assumptions about what objectivity means. And this speaks to the question, what is truth versus post-truth? Because the basic understanding, when I say, when I ask somebody what is objective, um, they mean, they what they understand by that is that it's true for everyone across all times, forever and always. It's a very platonic understanding of objectivity. Yeah. What post-modernity, one of the things that post, I mean, the, the modern movement also brought questioned this standard of objectivity, but not so much with science. And one of the things that happened in the early 20th century, even before postmodernism happened, is this notion of objectivity, even within the context of science, started to come into question. That's not to say that Newton, Newton's theory of gravity is not objective. It's not objective in the platonic sense. Yeah. It's still correct. You can still utilize Newton's laws of motion, even to the extent of sending the rocket to a moon. But what we've come to understand and learn is that what Newton said was not the full picture. And some of the basic assumptions that Newton had, like absolute space and time, were fundamentally incorrect. Yeah, yeah. And what Einstein showed, especially within the context of physics, and Darwin within the context of biology is that these ideas are true within the context of our, the framework in which they're being employed, um, which is contrary to what the common understanding of objectivity is. Even something like mathematics, which we found out in the 20th century, 
is not objective to the extent that it applies everywhere and always because what happened with ideas and i'm not talking about this philosophically i'm talking about this within the context of science there are limitations of our mathematical understanding the big, big bang cosmology is a perfect example of this mathematics breaks down at a certain point yeah. mathematics doesn't apply at a certain point not to say that what happened before then can't be well i won't even get into that that's all i wanted to say uh, it's issues of non-euclidean you know uh, foundational mathematics fundamentally changed at the beginning of the 20th century where you have competing theories of like the foundations of math um, and it's math's own internal consistency and the presumption that math and logic are the same thing breaks down in right. various regards. Um, but that's a separate topic. I think that when we talk about truth now, I think the best for myself at least uh, I think about Dewey's conception of warranted assertability and the idea of fallibilism, which is, you know, relates to like Peirce and also even Nietzsche, which is to say that maybe there is some way in which you can talk about the world in and for itself, but we can't know that. And even if we could, we would never know if we knew it. And instead, what we should focus on in a phenomenological sense is this idea of warranted assertability. Are you warranted to say the things that you say and in what regard? And that's where we get into hermeneutics and discourses. What is appropriate discourse and what's appropriate to say in a specific discourse relates to the discourse itself. And that's why, you know, you can't reduce everything to uh, the language of science because not everything, not everything is science. Not everything is reducible. No, don't go uh, like it's not. <laughs> You can you what I what I mean is you can describe most anything in science, but are you doing it appropriately? Like, are you talking about the full scope of the human experience of love by reducing it to chemicals in the brain? I don't think that you are. It's just a it's just its own form of perspectivalism, right? Like from the perspective of science, when we think of things like religion and we think of belief and we think of you know, feelings and things like that, that stimulate, you know, actions in those ways, then we reduce it to neurology. It doesn't mean that that doesn't, that explains, that's not completely It's a, it's a dimension. Yeah, it doesn't it's say that's not aspect. there. It is one aspect of. Certainly it relates to it, but yeah. it's not reducible to. I yeah, think that that's one right. of the things that, you know, the, the reduction, the problem with, uh, you know, the Vienna and Berlin circles, uh, logical empiricism broke down in the mid 20th century because of these problems. And I think that, you know, that's still news to a lot of Anglo American philosophy because they don't teach the history of philosophy. <laughs> um, yeah. And so we still, some people still talk about Carnap as if the elimination of metaphysics uh, is still relevant yeah. in some regards, they, in the way that he talked about they it. They reveal philosophical ideas that came in the last 50 years that are really just repetitions of a thousand year old ideas, and they're too ignorant to realize that. That's besides the point. We can critique American philosophy later. Well, um, I think that, you know, we could, if you want to go ahead and transition. So I think that that's, that's post truth in a post metaphysical postmodern sense in philosophy, which is to say yeah. that, you know, philosophy for about 2000 years was primarily not exclusively, but primarily about building large metaphysical systems, which were internally coherent, which could be theories of everything attempts to explain the entire world according to a specific set of discourses um, using specific vocabulary um, which could explain everything. And, you know, the prime architects of things like this would be like Plato, obviously, but especially folks like Hegel, right? So when you think of these large metaphysical systems, few things are as all encompassing as Hegel's philosophy. Um, but during much of the 20th century, across the board, at least in Western philosophy, where metaphysics was an issue, this is less an issue in Eastern philosophy because metaphysics was never as big an issue in Eastern philosophy. They started in reverse. They started with what we would call existentialism. Well, just so about, like Heidegger, about, Heidegger for also, example, yeah. Heidegger talks about uh, the Occident, the West, as... Heidegger, by the way. 
it's fine to hate Heidegger. Even <laughs> even if you even if you read Heidegger, you hate Heidegger uh, for various reasons. But Heidegger talks about the Occident, the West, as the land of the setting of being. It's the land of the end of metaphysics because it's the land of metaphysics. Metaphysics, metaphysics, not as a simple branch of philosophy, but metaphysics as a byword for this sort of system, systematizing philosophy. That it was all it, because the West was so focused on this kind of philosophy for so long, it was the place in which this sort of metaphysical philosophy would break down because it has to. Um, so anyway, with that kind of shift away from it and a shift to more, um, pragmatic philosophy, uh, a shift towards more applied philosophy, a shift away from logic and epistemology and metaphysics and the way we thought about it is where you get post-modernity, which is the attempt to rethink all of these problems post the end of metaphysics. And... Another interesting aspect about postmodernism is it's not the end of modernism. It's really just the application of the critical apparatus which was introduced in modernity to the notion of modernity itself. And you can say the same thing about postmetaphysics. Postmetaphysics isn't the end of metaphysics. It's the turning the critical gaze um, back onto the assumptions of metaphysics. And the same thing with truth. It's not the end of all conceptions of truth. It's the end of this this big T. Truth is this object out here that we're all kind of going towards. Instead, it's saying if there is truth in the world, it exists in these discourses. And to the extent to which we all recognize that, you know, it's true that we are sitting here, Right. It has to do with things like warrant of assertability. Well, on what ground can I make the claim that we're all here? Well, lots of grounds, right? Um, without having to introduce all of these metaphysical concepts, you can simply say it stands to reason mm -hmm. yeah. that we are here for all of well, these. It, it, yeah, and you're backing into the circularity of like self-awareness, right? Like. On, on the one hand, you could say, right, so this is, this is the struggle with like an absolute sense of truth, right? So if you, if you reduce it back in through history, we think of like scientific concepts like gravity. We think about the, the awareness of human beings who stood on the precipice of a cliff and said, if I fall, I'll die. If there is not the observer and the intellect there to interpret that moment, then does it really exist, right? So it's that, that, that moment, like, is gravity a real thing without the presence of an intellect perceiving it as real? That's a whole separate conversation that we could get into, which would be deep and complex, and, and probably, I don't think we could solve it. It's been talked about for several hundred years, if not well, I longer. I think it's pretty easy. I could solve it. <laughs> well, the issue is, <laughs> no, it, this, was, this was the strength of phenomenology, in the 20th century with Husserl and those that came after him in French from German philosophy, which is to say that we can bracket out all these questions. Like we can get bogged down and saying, well, how do I know that you're really here, that I'm really here without, you know, getting into solipsism and stuff. Um, how can we know these things? Well, phenomenology comes along and says, all right, well, this ongoing knife fight between idealism and realism is, irrelevant we can just simply say the world we will treat as real and then once you bracket it in that regard you can move on right you don't say it's real in a naive realistic sense instead you say we will we'll treat it as real and let's get on with other questions it's, it's not real in itself but it is real for us. It's which real gets for the back observer to the shared commonality, the experience. Yeah. Which I think, on some level, you have to bring in this quite the the idea of like a a context or a universality, like a a, a restricted universality, not a totality, like like a totalizing. But let's one more time touch the definition of post truth versus truth. 
Okay. And then let's step in. But I also have a problem with that. But okay. okay. Not the post truth versus truth, but the intuition bit. But well, I have, it. It comes I have a problem with both. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we do both truth versus truth. But. Starting with Michael this time. Yeah, so for me... Um, In 30 words or less. As best you can. I'm not yeah. going to count them, but I want to keep it short. Um, um, I'm count. I'll count. So, all right, that's my second word. So that's that's, that's word. three, right, yeah, right, three right, words. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, so truth, uh, very simply, was I think the basic realist position that our view of the war our view of the world uh corresponded to our beliefs of the world i believe there's an external world because i can see touch taste hear feel the external world post-truth for me with the, the again within the context of the field i study is that it's a it's a lot more complicated than just that and uh, especially within science what we've seen is that our basic intuitions about the world are in fact incredibly wrong so this makes truth a much more complicated subject. It's just what I would say. Well, so for example, in in contemporary Italian philosophy, uh, there is this movement called the New Realism, and it's not just in Italian philosophy. You have examples like Quentin Maiasu, which I think is French, and then you have like Graham Harmon, um, who's an American. Um, but the main guy in Italy is this guy named Maurizio Ferraris. And Ferraris's position is basically a naive realist position. And it rests on this idea that you can reduce um, phenomenology to an anti-realist position and you can make it a species of idealism. And in so doing, you have to rehash all of these old arguments. But he backs himself into a corner and basically has to accept that everything is like at a naive realist position. But if you look at the realist positions of someone like Bertrand Russell in the 20th century, his is a qualified realism, right? Um, so he, he's recognized as a realist, but not in a naive sense because the conceptions have progressed on, right? We well, can be. With yeah. Understanding of science, yeah. And so when people talk about realism, even there you have to be like, well, realism in what respect? I mentioned that to say that a lot of times, uh, postmodern philosophers are accused of being anti-realist. But if you actually read them, they're not saying, they're not making anti-realist claims. Instead, they're saying is what you mean by the real world has to be qualified. Yeah. And once you qualify that again, you're in discourse, you're in play and that has to be recognized. Um, even to the extent to which you go back to like Husserl and say, well, we're just going to say, real asterisk, right? It's still a necessary move. Hmm. Go ahead, Ray. We can move on to politics whenever y'all want. I hate politics. <laughs> we, politics. Well, the, the, the reason why post-truth yeah. is yeah, not... Right. The reason why we're talking about post-truth is not because, uh, you know, Maurizio Ferraris is having a debate with you know Gianni Vitimo. Yeah, yeah. We we're talking about it because it became a a buzzword because of people like you know Donald Trump and um yeah. I would say that the what I want to hone in on sort of in a illuminating moment from this conversation is post truth represents Post-truth represents a static form yeah. of, it's not even necessarily, I guess you could call it absolute, but with the recognition of alternative facts, if you lump that in with the post-truth phenomenon, then alternative facts would not be an absolute way of thinking as much as a recognition or, or an admission that somebody is static or unwilling to change, right? They're, they're unwilling to change their perspective. So there's no evolution or reformation of thinking. Um, truth, in the little t sense, has always been open to the ability to 
change and evolve and update itself. Whereas I think alternative facts and post-truth is really a question of the static frame of mind an unwillingness to change your perspective in the light of alternative or not even alternative, but contrary uh, ideas, facts, information. So that would be something I think is, as a way in a segue. I, I don't like Michael's uh, bang on intuition because I think that that's I wouldn't get into that. short sighted. I, I don't see how you can intuition of space and time is just the acceptance that human beings recognize it. Um, no, that's wrong. Uh, whether or not they interpret it correctly or whether or not it changes, you're never going to convince a human being that Newtonian physics is not correct. Even if there's a way of more deeply explaining the reality of existence. Well, we still the, say the, the sun three, rises. Yeah, the three Newtonian laws are going to be a, a very powerful means of explanation, regardless of whether or not we can more deeply explain material and energy within a system. It's just how, you can't. It's the three Newtonian laws are based <laughs> off of human sensory experience. No, they weren't. Yes, they were. <laughs> They're based you off can, pure mathematics. You can. Perceive and Newton had no it human is, experience. Have you read so anything about this? <laughs> yeah, because he was inside of his freaking house all day testing these stupid three laws. <laughs> you can demonstrate them in Euclidean geometry all you want, but the reality is is that you can see them right. in the real world. You're you're right in the sense that Newton's using I mean it, it's not really is a little bit of observation, but he is assuming a lot of Euclid and most of the axioms of Euclid were assumed to apply to physical reality. Okay. Yeah, and you know what I can't see easily? Gravity as it warps freaking space and time in the universe. Exactly. Is this yeah. a hill you're going to die on? That's <laughs> going to be... Uh, well, you you can see it, but you can. It's, 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 I get what you're saying. I, I said not easily, right? Yeah. So I'm not saying that you're not it, – it, there's no – well, uh, we're going to die before. I mean, they'll, they'll, <laughs> they, they'll figure out something. We'll look like idiots. In the, we, we already look like idiots, but we'll look like idiots in the future. But besides that, it's just too easy. It's too easy to recognize it. But beside, uh, uh, aside from all that, there is a baseline of commonality. If we think of objectivity as like common experiences, there is a baseline of physical things that are common to human beings. That they all experience on some level. Yes. We all fart. We all pee. Well, we all some, have a desire to have sure. intercourse with people. Okay. We can we can go on with physics <laughs> and biology, but those are all real. I, I, I can <laughs> literally question every one of those premises. <laughs> those are all real things. There are asexual people. There are people with you know like catheters. I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whether it's what is assisted happening? What is happening? or not, I don't I'm know. Just trying to he, say you know, he took line. it off the rails with universality. There's, universality. You've been to a you have been reading universality, modern, little universality. There are language games. Little universality that evolve, overlapping language games that in, influence each other that evolve into a new language game, a new way of seeing things. But there are always language games. They're contextual. They're contextual, and they are real for people who experience them. Whether they are right or wrong is a different thing. But if truth is about reality, then those things are real. If it's about things that can't be easily perceived or some sort of non-perceptible thing like molecules, I, I, I'm totally on board with all of what science has. But you, are we? You can't perceive them. You're still going to have to teach people that those are true, even if it is clearly, you know, studied and objectifiably true from a scientific lens. People are going to be born and they're going to experience the world in a very specific way. Yeah. I mean, I'm willing to accept that as long as you are also willing to accept that that can be wrong. At a it's always level. wrong. It's always wrong because we can't definitely well, always, prove it. But... They will undermine every law that we have under natural science eventually. 
it will be per re-perceived in a different way. There's almost, there's, there's no doubt in that. It's how history is always perceived, right? It's how it's always evolved. Yeah. Quantum physics will undermine the way that we perceive everything that is very practical to us, but it doesn't mean that those practicalities won't feel very real to us. Right. Yeah. And that's the big question is how much of that actually applies to uh, the terrestrial world as we experience it. The thing is, all of these are, they relate to a subject. None of this matters apart from subjects. And so, t yeah, because it's separating physical truths from like culturally and political truths. Yeah. But I just want to make this space. This space that you're making out? is in my, is, is, is in my <laughs> personal <laughs> space. The physical <laughs> side of things where this there is, is a shared commonality. Alternative facts don't exist because facts are restricted to this space. Belief and theory, truth in a lo lowercase t, yeah. is, that's not the same thing. We've talked about this in previous episodes. About well, I think, again, the at the end of the day, I think that truth. what you have is warranted assertability within a specifically recognized language game. Exactly. And language games evolve over time, but they evolve in relation to how we experience the world. So it's a give and take with the world. The world impacts us, and then we reflect on the world. And so even though we we have this fixed idea about moving towards truth, what we're really doing is evolving in relation to how we experience the world. I have, yeah, I have no illusions that we're moving towards truth. Like there's no, it's just, it's just change. Yeah. It's just change. That's most basic level. Things differ. Well, I think that no you know, value laden sense at all. It's just well, I think we've exhausted things. this aspect of the conversation. I think that I think that at this point we should probably transition to like the political discourse, don't you, Mike? Well, before we transition to political discourse, I don't want to put what we're saying about science, truth versus pro post-truth on the same plane as the political discourse truth versus post-truth because in science there's a clear standard of evidence that's required yes. for distinguishing what's true versus what's not true whereas in the political discourse especially once we're talking about uh post-fact society that's a lot more blurred and not as clear a standard of evidence so even if we even if me as a thinker can accept like Kuhn's critique of the progress and the development of science, that the misinterpretation of Kuhn is to take away from that, as a teacher of mine once said, that, well, that just means like everything's relative. Mm -hmm. But that's not actually what Kuhn was saying in terms yeah. of uh, standards of evidence and in terms of coming to an understanding about reality. What Kuhn was referring to there is what we were referring to earlier is that this platonic notion of objectivity has to be modified, has to be qualified, and that's not to say that we can't come to a better and better understanding of reality, it's that's just that we have to change our understanding of what we mean by truth, meaning that scientific truth does not refer to a capital T truth that exists outside of the universe. Yeah, which is why I was saying when you guys were fiddling with the camera and the PC that... That yeah, we just ignored everything. Yeah, so. I know, I know you ignored everything I said. It's, I feel like the issue we have is that there's a, there's a really strong sense of like static truth. Yeah. There's no openness for change or evolution or betterment or more sophisticated, whatever you want to call it, which is why I, I'm, I'm with you, Michael. I want to, we have to create this space to talk. Like when we talk about truth, there's a separate space in the world, which got blurred, I think, because of the desire to just, the anti-vaccination desire, the yeah. the coat, uh, what was it? The chloroquine whole thing, the, the shoot yourself up with chlorine because Donald Trump said that that could maybe like you know like well if we sh can we get the little UV rays in our body? <laughs> <laughs> Some serious shit he said, crazy stuff like that. That's the kind of you know. Spaces that well, it's getting it's 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 bleeding into the realm of science where there is a much more clear understanding. Well, the thing is, I think at a popular level, people recognize that 
science progresses, but the presumption is that amongst the, you know, the average person is that, well, whatever is, um, whatever is the current consensus is true. And there's no thought towards the future that, well, that means presumably that the present can't be the final word on truth because we know that things progress. So people look back on old scientific discoveries and say, Oh, how silly we were to have thought that. But then the average person doesn't project that into the future and say, well, of course what we think now cannot be objective truth in the way that we commonly talk about it based on that same principle. One of the pet peeves I have, and I'll probably have to repeat this whenever Ray gets back, is this presumption. And I think this is a good place to transition to the other discourse, which is to say that there is this tendency to blame the political discourse on the academic discourse, which is to say the issue is that a generation or two of students have been have had their conceptions of truth undermined by you know the pedantry of the academy questioning uh, conceptions of truth and that that has somehow you know I could if I had a dime for every crappy article I saw in you know like a pseudo intellectual journal talking about how Derrida led to Donald Trump. Like it's such a stupid <laughs> idea. It's very dumb. Yeah. Like if you just think about it, reflect on it for like more than a second, the notion that Rudy Giuliani is out there saying truth is not truth because of what Baudrillard, like yeah. Foucault, these guys are not responsible for the present moment. No. If anything, the programmers at Google and Facebook are more responsible. Like mm -hmm. not that many people read postmodern theorists mm -hmm. and even less understand. Right. So the collective, um, you know, the Jordan Petersons of the world clapping back at postmodernity as being responsible for the collapse of civilization. First off, he should look at who he's hanging around. Right. So, no, if anything, postmodern thinking makes you more suspicious and critical of just thinking in general. Yeah. <laughs> you just become hyper paranoid. You're just like, everybody has their own perspective on things. Is there any such thing as truth? And then you just have this hyper awareness of, well, if I believe in something, I'm really just, I may, I'm making that decision to believe in it. It's not because of some blind authoritarian perspective. Well, see, that's the thing is, is you, is there, Jordan Peterson may think that. Yeah that they have ruined truth, but everybody that follows Jordan Peterson is really following a modern approach. It's, it's the logical fallacy of believing in authority. It's the, the fallacy of believing in somebody that looks a particular way, acts a particular way, confirming the biases that you already have. It has nothing to do with the affirmation that Jordan Peterson or anybody like him is, you know, saying something that is legitimate or, something that you can check and verify. It's just platitudes and nonsense. The thing is, there's always been an appetite for motivated reasoning. Mm -hmm. And if you want to justify that, issue. yeah, if you want to justify that by appeals to post-modernity, you can do that, but you're only doing it to the extent to which you are uh, corrupting that discourse. Right, you're not basing it on that discourse. You you can justify it post hoc, but that's not where you're getting it from. So even if you know Kellyanne Conway, which she never did, but if Kellyanne Conway wanted to say, well, truth, there's no objective truth, and we know this because of Foucault, right? Did she act? Would she actually have have thought that, or would it have just been a convenience to say it? Right. Again, the, the notion that any of these these right wing grifters and hacks and political figures are making these appeals because they've read too much French philosophy is absurd. Um, but no, they're making the appeals because of capitalism. Yeah, <laughs> it's always capitalism. It's always capitalism. The, if you're looking for a, an issue right to blame, it's always capitalism. Yeah.
And I know that from reading too much French philosophy. No, that's not true. <laughs> Do we have any questions, or should we just... Too much German philosophy, I guess. Um, no question. I mean, I have a question for y'all. Okay, uh, if y'all have questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, so let's talk about, in political discourse, what has been referred to as post-truth, post-fact, post-fact conversations, specifically, and I think we're talking about American politics here, of course, especially with the presidency of Donald Trump. Um, and this accusation that has been leveled against Trump and by Trump, by Trump, the accusation has been about things like catchphrases that you've heard of, like fake news, this idea that um, media has an inherent and unavoidable bias, and that basically any negative representation of the political party can be taken as a representation of that bias. And then against Trump is the kind of accusation of post that we live in a post-fact, post-truth society that Trump's political rhetoric is not beholden to like truth claims. Yeah, that Trump can make one truth claim at the beginning of a speech and then turn around and say the exact opposite truth claim at the end of his speech. So let's unpack that a little bit. I'll say very simply that. It's all bias towards capitalist elite. There is no difference economically and in really from the perspective of status quo between your quote unquote fake news, woke liberal media, CNN, NBC, MSNBC, ABC, Fox News, and Donald Trump. They are all super wealthy people who have an interest and keeping things the way that they are or grifting on people who are being, you know, having hardships, which is more of Trump's thing and just keeping their, they are all the same people. They are two sides of the same coin. They speak slightly different terminologies. They speak slightly different political, political perspectives, but at the end of the day, they're all interested in maintaining their power and wealth in society. That that's the ultimate motivation. That's it. That's, if you want to, if you want to boil it down to simple terms, they are one and the same thing. The reason that people at CNN and MSNBC and ABC and all those news outlets bolstered Trump during the 2016 election is because Trump made good money. They knew that it was dangerous to do it. They didn't care. The only reason that Trump ran for the presidency is because he knew that the political stunt would be good for making money. He didn't care about anything else. Uh, clearly didn't even really want to be president, but he likes power and he likes money. He likes to fundraise. It was easy. The laws and the structures of all that are designed to benefit these people here. Nothing else matters. Next question. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> Again, back to what me and, you know, really what I learned from Jared, because he's our democratic socialist anarchist father here. Um, <laughs> capitalism is the root of all evil in our yeah. country. No, the question was, uh, okay, what do we mean by post-truth, post-fact in the context of political discourse? Um, well, the thing about post-truth and political discourse, again, this is a discussion about uh, political rhetoric and how, you know, it's uh, a question about how is it that political rhetoric has gotten to the point where it becomes so ideological that uh, truth becomes a matter less of uh, recourse to observable data than it does to uh, how does this fit within a wider ideological conception. And a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, the balkanization of the, uh, of the media, right? And so while you may recognize rightly, as Rand pointed out, that essentially media elites are all, you know, conglomerates, for the most part, are all conglomerates, which are owned by powerful elites. And yes, there are different flavors to the media, which are designed to, um, you know, target specific audiences. But at the end of the day, these are all people in a similar, have similar backgrounds, 
um, have similar class interests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, if you look at a classical trope like the liberal media, the notion that the media has a liberal bias, first off, part of that is based on like uh, polls amongst reporters. Yeah. But we live People in a capitalist model. If, well, I'm saying even, even if it were the case, this is something that Noam Chomsky pointed out a long time ago, which is to say that even if it were the case, and there's no reason to think that it's not, that the average reporter is Democratic supporting center left liberal. What difference does it make? Who owns the company? Yeah. And who sets the agenda for the company? Yeah. Is it the reporter? No. Is it the presenter? Is it the talking head? Or is it the Rupert Murdochs of the world? Yeah. The Roger Ailes of the world? Mm -hmm. And once you start thinking about it in that framework, then you say, how silly is it for who cares if Don Lemon or Anderson Cooper or whoever is a liberal? First off, you shouldn't be watching any of these people anyway. But in my opinion, do whatever you want. Um, but I don't get my news from TV news because if you want to look at information silos, one of the things in which you need to think about is what is, how do these people keep the lights on? Is there a, what's the business model for the, um, for the information that I'm getting? And if you have a business model, which is structured based upon ads, you're going to have sensationalized media. You're going to have a hierarchical structure, which is built on all of the negative aspects that we discuss in media. And it's a wonder to me how these same people can act so flabbergasted as to how is it that there's increased political tribalism, mm -hmm. right, in recent decades. Well, when you have persisted as a populace on an information ecosystem which trends towards tribalism, and you've done so for 20 plus years, it's only going to get worse. And there's a lot of blame on social media, which is warranted. But social media is just an amplification of the same tendencies, which are there in older print media and especially in cable news. And so to bring this full circle, to get back to your question, I think that part of the issue with the, the post-truth stuff is it's never self-critical. And this, this idea that my ideological opponent out there is always lying and is always wrong, and that I am never lying and never wrong, and what it means to lie and to be wrong simply is a matter of ideology. That's where you get into issues. So I think that one of the things that you can protect yourself against in terms of post-truth, post-fact, alternative fact thinking is to simply say, do these people ever question their own motivations? Do they ever draw attention to their own shortcomings, their own biases and presuppositions? And in either camp, you typically don't have that. So it's always, you know, the, the Lugenspresso, right? It's always the lying press. It's always, you know, liberals or the left or even, you know, those dumb rednecks over there, those Trump supporting MAGA people, whatever. There's a lot of self-flagellation on the part of like well-intentioned liberals to be like, oh, what we really need to do is reach across the aisle. And there's that constituency. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that you do have to be self-critical. I'm not saying that you have to always try to find common ground with racists. What I'm saying is you have to also recognize your own biases mm -hmm. and you can recognize that certain people just cannot be um, good actors in a political discourse. If they, if you never see them doing that, if you want to protect yourself from, the alternative fact convenience. So, so if we couch it in terms of what we've been talking about, which is each of these media 
organizations who have been really they're the ones who, nobody nobody on the street invented the word alternative fact or post truth or any of that crap. It's all media people. It's all like people in a position of power. It's just the convenience of being able to accept your own perspective on things while rejecting others, so you don't have to be you know you don't have the feeling of challenge. You're just creating a a barrier or a buffer to say, well, these are alternative facts. This is our way of seeing things. So that that's one thing. If you want to protect against that, then there are two things you can do. The the one thing you can do is recognize that cable media or conglomerate corporate media, there's no such thing as unbiased reporting. Unbiased doesn't exist in the think you the way you think it is. You can think of non-confirming bias, which they don't want to say because it's confusing and it's 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 harder to explain, but also it just is less convenient for them. But the reality is, is that every person on TV has a bias towards something. All the editors who post things have a bias towards something. And the company owners have a bias towards something. The most right? important bias. Which yeah, is, the most important know, bias. But that, importantly, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. No, it doesn't. To it doesn't say that something that... is biased doesn't mean it's wrong. No. So we use that word to say that the information is tainted because we still have this conception of objectivity. Yeah which is a modernist conception. Big, big O objectivity. But the, if anything, post-modernity has taught us that that notion of objectivity itself is the problem, that to recognize bias is, again, not to say that this information is inherently tainted or incorrect. It's to say that we should see the way in which we take this information and construct a narrative. And what is that narrative doing and how does that narrative relate to our own wishes and desires? And there are better narratives and there are worse narratives. And to allow for people to build narratives in a way that is not necessarily unbiased, but is not trying to confirm a particular bias just because they want it to happen is the key. And then alternatively, just seek out independent non-corporate as best you can media which fortunately there are some bastions of you know social media that allow individuals who may have an obsession with news or current events to then probe more deeply or see things from an alternative perspective and just balance it it's, it's really all a critical thinking matter and it's just a self-awareness that just because somebody on TV who makes a million dollars or more a year says it doesn't make it true. All right, so let me add a different angle to this that was brought up, and that's the role that technology slash social media has played in this idea and understanding of what post-truth is, what post-fact is. And this is another thing that's really interesting, putting it into a historical lens, because you would think that with the advent of mass information information available at a really easy that's available to anyone and everyone um, with minimal kind of buy-in like most people have access to the internet especially nowadays with like cell phone technology that this would lower the rate of misinformation but what we've seen especially over the past decade is that in fact, the opposite is true. Yeah. And that what we saw, especially with the last presidential election, with the use of social media by disinformation groups to promote uh, just, I mean, no other way to put it, but outright conspiracy theories about the election and about election fraud. So to what extent does, in general, technology play in this conversation, what role does technology play, and specifically, what role does how has social media itself kind of shaped the conversation? Well, I think that so if we look at you know the classic um, McLuhan art, so the medium is the message, and no, what I mean by yes. this in this context is to say that you know it's not just that social media has proliferated and that somehow social media is inherently built towards conspiratorial thinking. Instead, what it is, I think is again, look at how, look at how social media is monetized. And then I think that it's the same problem that you encounter with sensationalized print media 
and later with cable news, which is to say that the issue is not the technology as far as I'm concerned. The issue is the, um, the monetary structure. So it's built for conspiracy, for conspiracies because that's what's profitable. And, you know, clickbait articles get attention. Now, of course, there's a, there's a cognitive component to this, right? Um, that we are built for conspiracies to right. some respect. Right. And so it's playing, it's low hanging fruit. But the only reason in which, you know, this gets picked up by social media is because they prioritize uh, profit over accuracy. Same thing with cable news, right? They prioritize sensationalization. The reason why is because that puts eyeballs on the screen and eyeballs on the screen is ad revenue. The, the thing that I, I would tell students whenever I was teaching critical thinking is you as a consumer, when you watch TV, you think the product is the television show, right? That's not how the company thinks about it. That is just the filler to get you to watch the commercials in between. You, they keep the lights on by selling ad revenue. And the reason why they make, to the extent they make compelling television, they only do so, the justification for the company. So like individual creators may be motivated to express themselves artistically and create something that people want to watch. But the company men, the people behind the scenes, if they could if they could do programming, which was paint drying on the wall and be convinced that you would stick around for the Coke commercial in between, that's what they would sell you. And so as long as, and to as long as, and to the extent that something's profitable, that's what they'll give people. And whether it's Donald Trump or conspiracy theories, it's the reason why you have, the Sean Hannity's and Tucker Carlson's of the world is because that's what people will watch because it's, it uh, appeals to base motivations, base senses, uh, but it keeps eyeballs on the screen. It's profitable. And as long as it's profitable, the fact that it's nonsense is irrelevant. So companies like CNN, but it's really, you don't even have to demonize the individual companies. It's capitalism. It's the pay structure. The people that own society will poison society if it's profitable in the short term. There's no higher motivation. If you want to know why is this disinformation proliferated to such a degree, it's because that's what people are interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and it moves you know, it moves units. Yeah. And if it didn't, they would do something else. There's no higher motivation. There's no m morality in capitalism. No, I, I don't, I don't, and I don't always blame the consumer. And I don't think you were either in that, but I would argue that, and I'll, I'll say this and then I'll step back and present a more fulfilled question or answer to the question. But um, people, people in power who have created very economical and financially like robust ways of monetizing human interaction on the internet, recognize that they can create things that fulfill biases that keep people entertained. That's not a new thing. No. It's no different than, you know, wealthy people who own fucking tabloids and newspapers and yellow page journals and publications and pamphlet groups back in the day, right? Like when we came up with the Gutenberg press and we had an explosion of printing, it, it was no different than people who were just trying to convince other people of the way that they wanted to believe things, whether it was, you know, ill intended or not, it's still a manipulation on some level because argumentation and discourse is always a kind of manipulation. You're trying to compel people to either believe what you believe or not believe what they believe because 
It's also a vicious cycle, right? Yes. So yes. it's For it's sure. self reinforcing. So they create a desire, and then they have to fulfill that desire. Mm -hmm. So what they present is what you know creates a desire in the consumer, and then they have to satiate that desire by cre by creating more and more. And so this is the reason why it you know proliferates. Yeah. Um, so you show people you know, a certain kind of media, they get used to that sort of media and then you have to feed them more and more. And then, you know, yeah. Michael, can you restate the question one more time? Cause I just want to, we've been talking about this a minute. Or say another question. I mean, if we, since yeah. we're kind of drifting well, I a, into I the, a, I have a, you know, some perspective on it that's slightly different for yours, but yeah, the question was just the extent to which uh, social media has played in the post truth post-fact movement um, as it helped. Uh, well, I guess it helped. I don't think anyone is, would claim respect. that it has helped. Yeah. <laughs> no, to, to what extent is it responsible for? Yeah. Let me say that. I, I, w I will say there's a number of things. It's very, it's, it's complicated and it's not. It's complicated in the sense that it's a new technology and there's a lot of factors. It's not complicated in the sense that it's a different medium, but it's the same fucking reality. Like, because it's people. Because it's people and it's contained within a capitalist system. The people who have – and even before America existed, right? Like I had this strange debate with some friends one time about – and I'm taking on a side tangent, but I'll bring it back – about – just just follow me. Let me – allow me because I'm – how many people are with us right now? Seven. Oh, that's more than I thought would be here. I'll try not <laughs> to – it, it's slightly entertaining, okay? Slightly. Um, Get to the point, Raymond. <laughs> Why do we have beef in this country, but we weren't interested in bison? Right? In terms of people who eat meat. Because cows were not bite cows were not native to this country. They did right. not they were not here. We had bison. Mm -hmm. And I had people that I know, friends of mine, who said, Well, cow must taste better than bison, which is why we had it. But then you if you eat meat, right, if you're okay with that, and you have bison and you have cow. Bison tastes pretty damn good. There's not like, I don't know if there's a big decision making, but then if you think about the history of colonization, of economics, of power, people who ran cows, beef, in Europe and were colonizing forces in America have no interest in bison because bison would be a more democratizing force. They're more readily available. They don't have the presence they don't control. The there's population. no monopoly. No, there's it. no monopoly. So you don't care about bison. You bring cows in anyways because you already have monopoly. This is just a new market. It's the same damn principle with internet. People talk about the internet, the naivete of the Bill Gates, of the early internet people, Steve Jobs, all those people who were like, oh, the internet's going to save the world. Never stop to consider that power – and one sector will always conquer another sector. It's just the nature of capitalism. That's just the way things work. You brought cows over from Europe because you didn't give a shit about bison, despite how good the meat would have been, despite how easy it would have been for people to procure. You just wipe out a species in favor of a species that was not even native, that cost you money to get here because you already have a monopoly power over it. It's no different. It's a new medium with the same power structures that already existed it's no different in that way. In that way, people were super naive about what technology evolving through the internet would have brought to us. It did not democratize. It did not necessarily make things more free. It made things more complex. It gave greater opportunity for people to manipulate you and make money, which is all the more reason for the things that we try to do and we've talked about doing more of, which is equip the individual with the ability to discern bullshit or at least to refrain from making judgment or at least to recognize, have an awareness of the decisions they make in terms of believing things, even if they don't know the whole truth, right? Like there's just like being able to make a better judgment in a source. So if you want to talk about the problems that we've had with the post-truth society in terms of technology, it's only, it's only, I think it's only made it worse if not being the bearer of it because the technology just made it so much easier to do it.
It has not helped the individual at all on some level. I mean, it has and it hasn't, but for the most part, no. It's made rich people who are already rich more rich and more powerful and more given them more ability to control the preferences and the reasoning of the individual because the medium is so accessible and so easily digestible and so manipulative. Okay, Ray, you want to close this out with the question that you had? Since we're at the hour, 20 minute mark. The question that I had? No, the beginning? Yeah. What was that? I don't recall. <laughs> the, <laughs> <No worries. laughs> uh, 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 apparently, Ray, um, not to undermine everything that you just said, but. Uh, Please go ahead. Uh, basically, cows were more domesticated. That's the biggest thing. <laughs> biggest thing. It's um, an interesting question. <laughs> and that's all I'm saying. Why why cows over bison? They're equally tasty. I can only think that it's because there were monopolies already in cattle. And right. they, they wanted to export it. Final thoughts. Capitalism. Final thoughts. Truth versus post. No, the, the original question was is do we believe in whether or not there's really a post truth? Oh, okay. There? That was the that's a good question. final question. That's a good I, final I question. don't believe. I think that the reason people push it is for a number of reasons. They're overwhelmed. It's really hard to keep up with what is true and what is not. I encouraged all of my students to just be willing to accept indecision because a lot of things that we could quote unquote believe or not believe don't have a really strong impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Just be willing to say, I don't know all the truth. I don't know all the facts. It's a good exercise to just you know, express the humility of saying, I don't know. And at the same time, people are just fucking lazy, right? Like if you want to know the answer, or if you think you know the answer, challenge yourself, push yourself to look for differing opinions, to look for different ways of seeing the things and be willing to accept that you don't have all the answers and that some people may have a different experience from you that may be humbling. Be willing to not be lazy. Like it's hard to find truth in a world when you, where you're overwhelmed with truth that, you know, potentially truth at your fingertips of just the, just searching Google. Like it's really convenient, but that doesn't necessarily make it right. So like just be, very self-aware, the balancing scales is don't be lazy, right? And don't be quick to make decisions. That's what I always tell my decisions. Jared, is there post-truth? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense in which I've talked about it, in the sense in, in the post-modern sense in which philosophers discuss the notion of post-truth, they're absolutely right. In the, that is more nuanced, um, that discourse is impactful. There is no, you know, truth out there waiting to be uncovered like an excavation site. Oh, we've found truth. Truth is conversational. It's constructive. It's, you know, a part, it's the result of a dialogue. It's fallible. It's all of these things. Now, to Ray's point, you should be, you know, that should lead you to be teachable. Um, and to be a critical thinker is to be self-critical. And I think that the distinction between a lot, between genuine philosophers and a lot of hucksters and grifters out there is, you know, the Alex Joneses of the world don't tell you, you could be wrong, Right except to say you've been deceived you know the you know big 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 brothers out there and you've you know you're you've been a sheep but i'm going to tell you the truth doctors don't want you to know this <laughs> yeah one. yeah they i'm going to tell you what they don't want you they to know they don't want you to know this trick the instead you should always be in the position of you know is what i'm claiming warranted based on what how do i know maybe i'm wrong mm -hmm. and as long as you have that kind of i commit to being critical yet teachable 
I think that you won't you won't always be right because no one will be, but you will be in the process. Yeah. And if truth in this sense in which we've talked about it is useful, it's only useful to the extent to which truth is the result of a constructive, honest dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll say that um, there is post-truth in the sense that um, our naive realist positions about science have been greatly complicated. And the idea that um, that was comp that was shown to us by uh, Kuhn, starting with Kuhn, and then a lot of the French philosophers of science, the idea that science is that there's truth and that we're, we're slowly filling up the cup of truth and one day we'll, we'll, the, the cup will be full, right? But this, that view of truth is mistaken. The reason why that view of truth is mistaken is because it assumes this sort of platonic notion of truth. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is that um, science, the, the history of science is not the history of moving closer and closer to truth. It's the history of, uh, failed hypothesis. It's the this the history of negation. It's the history of trying out one theory, uh, making a hypothesis about one thing, uh, that hypothesis being demonstrably wrong. So we move on to the next hypothesis, um, and that's going to continue to be how science operates. If you're in a grad program or have been in a grad program, I and mean, that's basically what your thesis is: is testing out uh, one understanding seeing if it's correct or seeing if it's not correct. I mean, there's a problem with publication because we only pub publish the, the things that turn out to be correct, uh, which is a different problem all in of itself. But yeah, to me, that's what post-truth means. And something that Jared said earlier, post-truth is truth with uh, qualifications. And the qualifications, um, as far as I see it, are... Um, the, our, our understanding of reality is, is supplemented and kind of a foundational framework is provided by things like mathematics. Not to say that mathematics itself is some external platonic truth, because that's also not what I mean, but it provides the, the, the language to understand and to talk about these things in the same way that English provides us with a base level of communication to express these philosophical ideas. So post-truth in that sense. Now, the political stuff you just asked Jared about or Raymond about, um, I'm not well, really super interested in that. But Well, I can say this, that post-truth in the sense in which it's discussed, which is the notion, which is the idea that some people accuse post-modernity of advancing, which is this extreme relativism where that says that everyone's uh, naive, you know, feelings on a particular matter are just as valid as anyone else's. First off, no one actually holds that position. No, no one really thinks that if you believe an entirely contradictory thing from me, that both of those things can be held up as simultaneously true. No one thinks that. That's not a position which has been advanced by a philosopher it's, you know, people who have not read or do not understand philosophy, um, typically making a, a caricature of philosophy for their own political ends. Mm. But or to a, try to explain something. So the point is, you, you there are no alternative facts in the way in which, you know, political pundits have talked about them. It's just a permission structure. But there are genuine... Um, there are genuine disagreements yeah. uh, between different hypotheses, which are equally valid to the extent to which they're both warranted, right? So the disagreement between two frameworks for understanding the same um, information can be equally valid. They're equally valid because they have their own warrants and they exist within their own universe of discourse that's not the same thing as simply saying well you think this and i think this and let's just agree to disagree because we're both right at the end of the day no one thinks that way really no no deep thinker thinks about things that way and so there's not post-truth in that kind of pejorative 
popular sense of the term. What we have been talking about is a more nuanced conception of problematizing a very naive view of truth, which many of us have lived with. Mm -hmm. But upon even the slightest reflection, we have to recognize it's problematic. Um, and so if you're willing to question anything, then you're willing to question that conception of truth. And I think that's perfectly valid and acceptable. Yeah. Ray, final thoughts before we close it out? No, I just, other than I'm right and you guys are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> We're both right because no, of relativism. It's, it's, uh, it's ridiculous because I agree with you. I just, I just. You're resisting the terminology. I'm resisting the terminology, yes. Yeah, I don't really because like the I, I, I think the. Do it. <laughs> I don't like some of how Jared, what, what Jared said, but yeah, maybe a different. The post tree thing for me comes very specific from. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think any of the postmoderns really talked about tr post truth. They didn't use that terminology no, that I'm aware of. No, that's a contemporary really terminology it because I feel like they legitimately wanted to find a way of talking about it. They just were struggling to do it, um, and I have faith in them. I mean, I, you know, most of them have passed on now, but. I don't think they have any. The post truth thing is a manipulation. It didn't originate it's, with this thing, but there was a book that came out in recent years. It came out in like 2017, I think. Um, and it's called Post Truth. And I don't remember the author, yeah, yeah. but it came out from like the MIT <laughs> press or something. But it's a popular book. Yeah. And well, MIT doesn't have strong. Either. I don't know I if it was MIT. It, it was a well, it was an academic publishing house, but it was a popular book, and it's called Post Truth. Yeah. And in it, the Pop author Boston. basically explained. Well, he basically makes the claim that uh, I don't really know how, and if I if I were to read too deep uh, into these French postmodernist thinkers. Uh, that it would probably contradict this assertion. He doesn't state it this boldly, but he basically. Uh, says that, well, if I were to read these guys, then obviously they probably wouldn't be making this claim, but I'm going to go ahead and blame the current political post-truth situation on them anyway. It's a very yeah, absurd yeah. self my, my My only reason for pushing back on the is post-truth a thing, saying no as opposed to yes, is because I'm separating the traditions of philosophy from popular thinking. Yeah. And the reason I'm doing that and the reason I'm staying with that is because in my students, my biggest thing was like, there's a lot of fucking information out there and it's hard, but at the same time, we just, we, we can't afford to be lazy. We have to be willing to like take the time to either figure it out or just be willing to refrain from judgment. And if we can do both of those things, right. When it's appropriate then we don't make stupid decisions like following people who are clearly con artists, and and that's my that's my on those that's things uh, on those things of which we cannot speak, we should remain silent. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, and 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 that's so perfectly good okay. We just don't like there's just the patience, and I'm willing to accept that people will try to manipulate you. People are trying to present a perspective that they may or may not be an expert on, and they may not have information on because there are other influences at it. But that doesn't even matter as long as you're aware of the fact that you can't be confident that what you understand about a situation is not the whole situation. And there are moments when you can be like the you know, court system had 60 some odd cases come against it for voter fraud in 2020 and none of them panned out. I think you can safely say that there probably wasn't any voter fraud that would be consequential in an election like – Let's move on with life. Well, again, I think the importance is the two different discourses. Like there can be two, there can be two good faith arguments which contradict each other, in which you can say, "Well, both are valid opinions," yes. and you can reasonably accept that both parties are acting in good faith. Whereas in a political discourse, you know, <laughs> the Kelly and Conways of the world are not acting in good faith, uh, and even if they're lying, or even if they're telling the truth using factual information. Is in the service of, of a BS narrative, yeah. And so you can lie with facts, and that's yes. the that's the thing. You can lie with facts or half truths or you know un un com, incomplete truths. And so I the will, issue goes beyond just facts in the world. It has to do with 
is a person acting it's, in good faith. It's not, it's not even facts in the world. It's well, what we would say, what I would argue the three of us would say is a misuse of the idea of facts. Um, which the news media should almost never use. Well, this is the problem with the notion of and objectivity, which is facts are facts, right? Facts yes. yeah. don't care about your feelings, some schmarmy people like to say. Yeah. Um, Shout out if you want to come on the channel. Schmarmy <laughs> people. <laughs> if, if, Mr. Shapiro. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Sh oh, fucking Shapiro. If Shapiro <laughs> wants to on the channel. If, yeah. There are smarter people than us that could tear your asshole anew. But the yeah. the bench up here, I'm more than happy to do so. <laughs> All right, we're getting off track here. But you know the Ben Shapiro's of the world, like you can use facts and still be lying, mm -hmm. and you can still you can use facts and still create a narrative which is a bad faith yeah. argument. In which case you are by other means still lying. Yeah. Um. All right, I gotta go to sleep in like five minutes. Yeah. So, we're, um, we're, we just keep dragging this out. I really appreciate this was great. Yeah, yeah it was ahead, a lot of fun. Glad we got Thanks. those jabs in at Ben Spear at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank y'all for stopping by. Um, yeah, leave some comments, a like, let me know if you like this. I'm gonna try to get these guys on the channel more, but uh, anyway, good night. See y'all later. Good night. Peace. Thank you for your service.